the first item of business, I should be sitting before I say that, too quick. The first item of business uh, is portfolio questions. And as usual, in order to get as many people in as possible, nice short questions, nice succinct answers. I live in hope. Number one, Mark McDonnell, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider traffic management options for the A90 A944 junction. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, technical advisors are closely monitoring this location. Should this indicate enhancements are required, consideration will be uh, discussed with the local authority. In the meantime, we ask everyone using the new route to proceed with additional caution until they are fully familiar with the layout. Then, officer, I would also like to offer my deepest sympathies to those affected by the accident on the A90 last night. As police investigations are ongoing, it would not be appropriate to comment further at this time. As part of standard policy, I have asked my officials to meet with Police Scotland and operating company to obtain more information. Mark McDonald. Uh, President Officer, I echo the remarks the, when the Cabinet Secretary makes in relation to the tragedy yesterday evening. The A90 944 Kingswell South Junction at the AWPR has caused some concern for my constituents. While the AWPR itself uh, has been a, a great boost to the area and has reduced journey time significantly, at peak times there are issues regarding queuing of traffic and the difficulty of negotiating the roundabout at the A944. Given that temporary traffic lights which operate at peak times exist further along the A944 at Kings Wells, is that an option which the Cabinet Secretary is open to considering for this junction to ensure smooth flow of traffic? And what kind of time Thank scale you. will we be Thank looking you, at? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Signing officer, as a member would uh, appreciate with a major piece of infrastructure such as the AWPR, there can be uh, a period of bedding down in how that then and how uh, the local traffic plans uh, start to develop in the use of the new road and how that impacts on uh, secondary roads coming off the AWPR. Uh, that work is presently being evaluated and considered uh, to see how uh, travel patterns are being established, including at the very junction the member has uh, referred to. Uh, given that the technical assessments are being undertaken at this present time, uh, they will then evaluate whether there are further measures that need to be taken forward, including the suggestion which has been made by the member uh, and the technical advisors will then report back to Transport Scotland, uh, who will then engage with the local authority to explore what further measures may be necessary at the particular junction that the member has referred to. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary has mentioned uh, these uh, assessments and I'm sure he will recognise that the impact of the AWPR, very welcome impact, ha, uh, extends beyond the immediate vicinity of the new road uh, and affects the wider road network. Will he agree that future judgments on road network development across the region should be based on traffic assessments undertaken that take into account the impact of the AWPR? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, President Officer, the AWPR is having a significant, a significant positive effect on the northeast of uh, Scotland, and of course, there will be implications that it can have for uh, other road developments in the area in the years ahead, including with the A96 uh, proposals and uh, how that may link into the AWPR and how traffic flows change. That's why it's important during this bedding down period, uh, as people start to establish the use of this particular route, uh, that we make sure that any information that is used to uh, take forward proposals for other uh, road developments in the area reflect those changing patterns and the changing road use within the, the area. And that's why decisions around any other major trunk road investments in that area will be based upon up-to-date data that informs those decisions. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. I also echo the Cabinet Secretary's comments in relation to the tragic events we heard about. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that years of real-term cuts to funding from the SNP mean that Aberdeenshire Council is now the worst in Scotland for the standard of its bridges, uh, especially arising from road developments, and many of them can't meet the demands of modern traffic. So what support will the Scottish Government provide to Aberdeenshire Council to repair or replace its deterioration? deteriorating bridge infrastructure before it's too late. It's a bit, sh bit wide of the mark about the A9 944 junction. <laughs> it's up to you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, what is a bit rich is listening to a Conservatives talking about cutting budgets uh, uh, <laughs> ah, from right. anyone yeah. in this particular chamber because uh, given their own track record at a UK level, as the members are aware, the bridge is on a local road which is the responsibility of the local authority. It will be for them to decide on what action they take in relation to the matter. Question three, Jenny Gilruth to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Leadenmouth Sustainable Transport Study. Cabinet Secretary. Further to the Members' debate in Parliament, Transport Scotland is leading the transport appraisal work for the Leadenmouth Sustainable Transport Study in collaboration with Fife Council. 
Since I last spoke on the study in Parliament, the preliminary options appraisal has been completed and the six options emerging from this stage have been published. Transport Scotland and Fife Council have nearly completed the technical review of the preliminary options appraisal report. Uh, the work on the final detailed options appraisal is underway. Uh, this reflects the most recent update sent to the member and other stakeholders on the 28th of February, published on Transport Scotland's website. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell my constituents when he expects the final detailed options appraisal will be published and how this information will be shared with elected members and with the community of Leavenmouth? Cabinet Secretary. Representing uh, officer, uh, Transport Scotland officials and their consultants gave a commitment to elected members and other stakeholders at the most recent workshop held in Leaven in November that they would continue to keep stakeholders up to date on the study, including inviting elected members and other stakeholders to a further session in Leaven to update them on the outcomes of the final study report. It's not possible to provide a date for publication of the final study report at the moment, while work on the final stage of the study is ongoing. Although I will ask my officials to update the programme on the project website as soon as possible and to highlight this to stakeholders in their newsletter. I'd also like to uh, reassure uh, the member and her constituents that I'm uh, committed to completing the Leaving Mouth Sustainable Study Transport Study. I understand frustration around the time it has taken, uh, but it's important that the study is carried out robustly in line with the Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance, as any transport investment decision have to be based upon robust evidence. Willie Rennie. The, the Minister is right. There is quite a lot of impatience in Fife now because this has taken an age just to get to this stage. And I do welcome the support of the Minister, but I would urge him to try and accelerate the process from now on. So once the option appraisal process and the options are published, I think he should try and accelerate the next stage of it because people in Fife are running out of, of patience on this issue. A question in there somewhere, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Zain Officer, um, I, I recognise the concerns that the member has uh, raised. It's an issue which the uh, local member, Jenny Ruth, has raised with me previously, and I can assure her that as much work has been, that can be done has been undertaken. But you'll also appreciate that this is a collaboration between Transport Scotland and Fife Council, uh, and that requires sufficient time in order to that, allow that work to be undertaken appropriately. But everything that can be done in order to make progress with these reports has been undertaken, and I hope to have them published in due course. Question for Alec Paul Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects the one-year review into the operation of the Queen's Ferry crossing. Cabinet Secretary. Transport Scotland is undertaking an evaluation of the fourth replacement crossing project in line with guidance to compare, compare conditions one year after motorway regulations came into force in February 2018 with forecasts made during project design and development. I expect that the one year after evaluation report will be completed in the autumn. Further evaluations will be undertaken at three and five years after motorway opening. The new crossing has increased resilience for the over 70,000 vehicles using it each day. Since it opened to traffic, there have been at least 22 occasions, possibly now 23 after the storm last night, when it remained open where the fourth road bridge would have been closed or restricted to HGVs. Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Since the Queen's Ferry crossing has opened, it has fundamentally altered traffic volume and flow in the Royal Borough of South Queen's Ferry in my constituency. So let me preempt the review by telling the Cabinet Secretary we need a box junction on the bridge access roundabout, better traffic management on the motorway slip roads, local access to the southbound M90 from South Scotston, and a pedestrian crossing on the Bowness Road, which has seen a huge spike in traffic outside the Eklund Primary School. On publication of the review, can, can you, you ensure get, that Can you conclude? I will conclude, Presiding Officer. Can he ensure that Transport Scotland commit the necessary resources for these structural changes? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I hear the list of issues that the member wants to see addressed. Uh, however, I won't preempt the study and allow the study to be undertaken and then for the findings of that to be considered. And of course, uh, Transport Scotland will then consider what further measures may be necessary as a result of the findings. Jamie Green, briefly. 
Uh, the final completion date for outstanding snagging works has been pushed back three times. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain to the Chamber why and if all works will be completed by the end of 2019 or not? Cabinet Secretary. So officer, the contractors intend to complete the remaining snagging work this year. Question five, Bob Doran. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what pro, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action is, is near that read at someone else's question, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to alleviate peak hour delays and cancellations on the Scotrail, Glasgow, Queen Street, Maryhill, Annie's Land service. Good job, I was distracted temporarily, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. PPM for the Annie's Land route has been consistently above 90% over the last 12 uh, periods, which is better than Scotrail service as a whole. Uh, in the most recent uh, rail period PPM, uh, uh, railway period PPM, it was 93.4% as opposed to 89.8% for ScotRail. However, the level of cancellations on peak services experienced by passengers across the country, including the members in the members' own constituency, have been too high, and ScotRail's remedial plan is currently being reviewed by Transport Scotland. Bob Doris. Thanks, President Officer. I, I, think, I think those statistics uh, belie the reality of peak hour cancellations on my line, quite frankly, Cabinet Secretary. I previously called for an improvement plan specific to the Maryhill line uh, to address these issues, and I've also met with Alec Hines, MD of ScotRail. I've had sympathetic words from ScotRail, but no discernible action or improvement. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to arranging a meeting with ScotRail and myself so once and for all we can establish an improvement plan so that my constituents get a train service that they actually deserve. Cabinet Secretary. I well, to understand the concerns that have been raised by the member. In the period 12, there were 240 planned peak services which ran between Annie's Land and Glasgow Queen Street. Out of the 240, 11 of those services were cancelled. That is 4.8%. Uh, as I stated in the Chamber, I expect ScotRail to continue to improve services across the country through its remedial plan. I do appreciate, of course, though, the concerns that have been raised by the member concerning busy peak services and will make arrangements for Mr Doris to meet with myself and with the senior management of ScotRail to discuss these matters further. Colin Smith, briefly, please. Thank you, President, President Officer. Transport Scotland will have received the first of two remedial plans from ScotRail. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm the Government's response will require ScotRail to hit the targets they are paying £960 million of taxpayers' money a year to deliver, including the punctuality target of 92.5%? And when does he think that target will be reached? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the member will have an opportunity to look at the details of the remedial plan when it's published and the Scottish Government's response to it at that time. Question six, Phil Bowman. I thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on meeting the targets set out in the Tayside and Central Scotland Transport Partnership Regional Transport Strategy 2015 to 2036 refresh. Cabinet Secretary. It is the duty of each regional transport partnership to draw up a strategy for transport within its region, uh, having regard to the current national transport strategy. The monitoring of performance against regional transport strategies is a matter for the relevant transport partnership. Bill Bowman. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Section 5.2.4 of the strategy refers to health and transport and aims to improve equality of access to health care and provide health care that is readily access accessible. At Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee, there is inadequate access and parking affecting both the hospital and surrounding residential areas, causing difficulties and stress for staff, patients and local residents. Dundee Council and NHS Tayside seem unable or unwilling to act to remedy this. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to get a remedy to this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so officer, the issue which the member raises is a matter for the local transport strategy and local transport partners. That includes the local authority and the health board. Uh, the actions that they're going to take to address these matters, he'd be better directing it direct to them. Question 17, Locker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure there are no barriers to businesses accessing broadband. Cabinet Secretary. The DSSB programme uh, has extended fibre broadband access to businesses across Scotland with over 920,000 homes and businesses connected to date and rollout continuing throughout 2019. The R100 programme will build on this success, ensuring every business in Scotland has access to superfast super broadband. 
We are also providing a range of support services to businesses, including the Digital Boost Programme for, uh, via Business Gateway, uh, which offers one-to-one -one support and advice for uh, companies, as well as seminars and workshops throughout Scotland. The Digital Development Loan is also available for registered Scottish SMEs looking to invest in their digital capabilities and skills. Dean Lockhart. Evidence to the Economy Committee, nor a senior chair of the Strategic Board, highlighted that only 9% of business in Scotland embed digital in their business operation. That compares to 43% in other countries. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to address this low level of digital uptake by business in Scotland? And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with our calls to create a dedicated institute of e-commerce to improve digital support to business in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, an officer, as a member will be aware, we are taking forward a range of different actions in order to help to support business, businesses in their uh, digital uptake. And a key part of that is through the DSSB programme in order to make sure that they've got access to uh, fibre uh, broadband in their premises in order to make sure they can capitalise on digital capabilities. And that's why we're also extending that uh, through the R100 programme. Uh, the member will recognise that connectivity through being able to access fibre uh, broadband is key to many businesses and be able to actually capitalise on uh, the digital capability. So, for example, in his own uh, regional area, places like Clackmannanshire, they have saw fibre coverage increase from January 2014, where it was at 55.9% to 99.8% to support businesses and personal users. So connectivity through having access to digital uh, fibre broadband is key to helping to support businesses be able to access uh, the digital markets that they want to utilise. And that's why the DSSB programme has only achieved its target, it's exceeded it, and the R100 programme will build upon that moving forward. Bruce Crawford. Officer, would the Cabinet Secretary to confirm that as of September last year, 95% of properties in the Stirling area were able to connect to faster infrastructure thanks to Scottish Government spending. That's 16,000 more connected, for example, than it had been left to the UK Government. And Dean Lockhart needs to get real. Cabinet Secretary. So, and also the member will recognise is that digital connectivity is a matter which is wholly reserved to the UK Government. But given their failure uh, to take this forward effectively, we as a government have had to step in yep. and actually take forward action addressing this. The member makes a very good point. Uh, in terms of Stirling as a local authority, in January 2014, uh, fibre coverage was at 58.6%. As a result of the Scottish Government's DSSB programme, it is now at 95.8%. Had we left that to the UK Government, we would have been nowhere near that particular target. Yep. The member will also be reassured that given that there's still a gap of uh, almost 4% within his constituency, the R100 programme has a particular emphasis on rural areas. And that will look to cover the areas within our rural communities that presently don't have access to fibre broadband. That's a £600 million programme which the Scottish Government is investing. However, only £21 million is being contributed by the UK Government, oh, yeah. despite the fact this is an area of their responsibility. Question. Question eight, Margaret Mitchell, please. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made following the one year after strike revaluation of the M8, M73, M74 improvement project. Cabinet Secretary. My officials at Transport Scotland are undertaking an evaluation of the M8, M73 and M74 improvement project in line with Scottish Trunk Road infrastructure project evaluation guidance. Evaluations are carried out to assess the impact of the scheme by comparing conditions after one year with forecasts made during scheme design and development. Subsequently, three years after opening, a further evaluation will be undertaken. Given the scale of this particular investment, a third evaluation of this project will be undertaken five years after opening. The one year after opening evaluation report, the first of the three evaluation reports will be completed in the autumn of this year. Margaret Mitchell. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware there are numerous post-completion project problems, including the replacement of the Bodwell Mini roundabout with traffic lights causing congestion and Hammond race days, tailbacks on approach loads where none previously existed. So will he take the necessary measures supported by South Lanarkshire Council, businesses and commuters to have the roundabout reinstated? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, so officer, the member will be aware that the Bodwell Road signalling junction uh, was constructed in a way which was to make sure that it complied with the guidance for uh, linking into the M7, the M8, uh, M74, M73 improvement uh, project. There has been work undertaken there in order to introduce the vehicle actualisation system uh, in order to make sure that it's working properly. Uh, that is now uh, being commissioned uh, and ongoing operations are being maintained and the signals are now under the control of South Lanarkshire Council. Any changes to them would then be for a matter for South Lanarkshire Council to look at taking forward. Thank you. That concludes questions on transport, infrastructure and connectivity. And we move on to questions on justice and law officers in just a few moments. Question one, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to prevent knife crime. Cabinet Secretary. I'd first like to take this opportunity to wish the young boy who was injured in Glasgow this week uh, due to a, a knife uh, incident uh, a full and speedy recovery. My thoughts are very much with him uh, and his family. Now, alongside tough enforcement, our approach is very firmly focused on prevention and early intervention. We've invested more than 17 million in violence prevention. Through the work of the Scottish uh, VRU, uh, the Violence Reduction Unit, Medics Against Violence, and our many other partners, we've uh, seen police recorded crimes of handling an offensive weapon fall by 65%. Uh, however, further reducing incidents of knife crime is clearly a key priority for this government. I'm meeting with uh, Nevin uh, Rennie and Christine Goodall on Friday to discuss this. Uh, alongside this work, we'll continue to invest in violence prevention initiatives such as No, no Knives, Better Lives, uh, Youth Engagement Programme, which specifically aims to reduce the incidents of violence and knife carrying amongst young people. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? In, in East Ayrshire, the number of weapon crimes recorded between April and December 2018 has increased compared to the same period last year. New stop and search guidelines for police were introduced in 2017, which restricted constables' powers. Now, recognising that a balance has to, be, has to be struck here, Cabinet Secretary, can he uh, tell me what research the Scottish Government have undertaken to ensure the new guidelines do not unduly hamper officers' ability to detect and prevent such violent crimes. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Brian <coughs> Whittle for the question? I, I know he asked the question absolutely in, in, in good faith and, and he has a genuine uh, interest in this. What, what I would caution him, and, and, and I do this, as I say, very sincerely and genuinely, is that taking quarterly statistics, um, uh, you know, or snapshot of, of one year statistics, for example, uh, can be quite dangerous. I think we have to look at the long term trend and the long term trend in Scotland has been a positive one, as I say, a, a reduction of handling an offensive weapon by, by 65% uh, in, in, in a decade. Emergency admissions to hospitals due to assault by a sharp object have fallen by 59% and so on and so forth. But uh, in terms of his, his, his substance of his question, uh, he will be reassured by the fact that I have regular engagement with the Scottish Police Federation, uh, as, he, as he would know and expect with the Chief Constable. Uh, and of course, when these matters are raised, uh, of course, I will take them, uh, look at them uh, very, very seriously. But our focus has to be absolutely on the prevention and that is what this government is investing in. Daniel Johnson, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary, I think, rightly highlights the role of the VRU and indeed the importance of preventative steps. But the Scottish Police Federation are very clear about the pressures that there are on local policing in terms of response officers and other local division officers. Now, we can argue about what the meaning of reductions in local divisions means, but surely any reduction in capacity to carry out those proactive preventative measures by local division officers is a concern if we want to reduce knife crime on our streets. Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I'd say to Daniel Johnson is uh, the numbers of police officers uh, has increased by about 940 since we inherited uh, power in 2007, uh, and we've seen knife crime uh, of course fall quite drastically in the figures that I've just mentioned. Uh, the, the correlation, of course, or, or the comparison, I should say, uh, would be with south of the border where we've seen certain crime types rise, and that has been, I think, attributable undoubtedly in part to the severe reduction in police officers. So we'll continue to invest in the police uh, by uh, protecting the resource budget by, of course, uh, as we have done, increase uh, the numbers since we inherited them in 2007. And of course, I will continue to listen to the Scottish Police Federation uh, and indeed the Chief Constable and others around what further we can do uh, to tackle the scourge of knife crime in our societies. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that knife crime in North Ayrshire has fallen by a remarkable 77% under this SNP government. Whilst there can be no room for complacency, what lessons can be shared with institutions south of the border which are currently grappling with a surge in knife crime, particularly in London? Cabinet Secretary. 
But our, our Scottish Government officials have had a very good engagement with uh, the, the administration in London uh, and also with the UK Government. Uh, he will remember uh, not too long ago Sadiq Khan mentioning that they would have a London uh, VRU very much based on the Glasgow model, the Scotland model of a violence reduction unit and, and that was informed by his officials coming up to Scotland to have a very positive uh, engagement. Uh, I know also in London, in fact just today the, the spring statement announcing uh, I think the, 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 uh, the uh, 100 million uh, for, for tackling knife crime, specifically a portion of that money to be into a, uh, in, into a UK VRU which again has been informed by the experiences that we've had up here in Scotland. So uh, yes, we are not complacent. Kenny Gibson's right to make that point where we can share expertise uh, and, and where we've had successes uh, with other parts of the United Kingdom or indeed uh, wider than that, then of course we will share those expertise. Question two, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how much funding it provides to organisations that aim to reduce and prevent sectarianism in society. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has invested 13.5 million to support anti-sectarian uh, education in schools, prisons, workplaces and communities over the past seven years, which has supported over 100 projects to deliver anti-sectarian education and activity across Scotland. This includes uh, 515,000 for nine projects, including Nell by Mouth and Sense Over Sectarianism in 2018-19. Uh, we intend to build on this work in 2019-20 by ensuring there's a real terms increase to the funding for this area of work. I will shortly make an announcement about, this, about the specific work that will be funded in 1920. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and it's clear from his answer that there's a lot of work being undertaken by third sector organisations to eradicate sectarianism in Scotland. For example, through the, the work by the aforementioned Nil by Mouth, West of Scotland Regional Equality Council and North Kelvin Sports, all of whom are members of my cross-party group in combating sectarianism in Scottish society. But would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that while sectarianism is undoubtedly a societal issue, football is a huge part of Scottish society and therefore they too must play their part in the eradication of this terrible problem which so often rears its ugly head in their stadia. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank James Dornan for, for raising that issue? He's raised it many times uh, in this chamber and he should be uh, given credit for that. Uh, I know he's suffered uh, a lot of abuse for the fact that he's raised his head above the parapet to talk, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and to mention this issue in this chamber uh, and very publicly. So can I thank him for that? Uh, he's absolutely right. Of course, sectarianism uh, is, is, is a wider societal issue and therefore the work that is being done in communities is very, very important. But it would be silly. It would be, uh, I think, ignorant. It would be uh, putting our heads in the sand to ignore uh, the very obvious um, point around uh, 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 recent unacceptable conduct in this regard uh, and around football. Uh, and therefore, uh, of course, uh, I have said many a time and I will repeat and re-emphasize that I think the clubs have to take a real responsibility in this regard. And if they don't, then of course the government uh, reserves the right to act. Liam Kerr, briefly. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary talks about where the funding is going, but a written answer provided to me by the Scottish Government in October revealed that out of nine organisations funded by Scottish Government to tackle sectarianism, only one, nil by mouth, that James Dornan mentioned, takes its messages to workplaces. Now, of course, education in schools is vital. What steps are the Scottish Government taking to improve the number of initiatives aimed at working age adults? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a very good point. Uh, and of course, as I said, I will be making an announcement shortly about the specific work that will be funded in 1920. Uh, we have to, of course, uh, work in, in schools and workplaces and communities, prisons uh, as well. So I, I will have a look again at uh, the organisations that we are funding. If we think we can build upon that, if we think there's more that we can do in, in, in specific sectors and, 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 and uh, uh, areas of society, that, that, then we should do that. Uh, it is a societal-wide issue from young, I'm afraid, uh, right the way to, to, to old. And therefore, uh, we should make sure that we're covering as much of that uh, as possible. So I will reflect on what the member says. I have an announcement, as I said, to make uh, shortly on this, but I'm happy to keep the conversation going with Liam Kerr and anybody else who has an interest in tackling this scourge. Question four, Keith Brown. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many of the prison population are veterans? Cabinet Secretary. Of March, uh, 6th of March 2019, 255 people in SPS's care uh, disclosed that they were veterans. Keith Brown. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and ask whether he could confirm what steps are in place uh, to identify veterans on entering the prison population and what supports are in place to ensure their often distinct needs and circumstances are addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Keith Brown uh, for the question and again to put on record his obvious in uh, interest uh, in, in all issues veterans that he has championed uh, for many years. When individuals enter custody, they are asked 
uh, if they are military veterans and the SPS is committed to providing care uh, and support to those veterans that are uh, sentenced to custody. Uh, each prison has a veteran custody support officer. Uh, they provide information, coordinate activities uh, and services. Uh, they also meet uh, as well uh, nationally uh, and they involve organisations like Poppy Scotland, the Royal British Legion Scotland and Apex to attend their national meetings. The services they provide differ from, from prison uh, to prison, just to give them a flavour, for example, in Barlini, uh, they've managed to successfully arrange residential places on release for veterans uh, with specific support issues such as mental health and addictions. Uh, and, and, and in other prisons such as HMP Edinburgh, they hold coffee mornings every month for veterans in, in custody, uh, usually attended by 40 plus individuals. Um, and, and in other prisons, there are more one-to-one -one peer to peer mentoring support. But I can give uh, more information in writing uh, to, to the member. There's a lot of support there, but I don't doubt, uh, you know, there's more that can be done to support veterans uh, in custody. Maurice Corey, briefly, please. Thank you. Um, amongst the veterans who are serving currently prison service, uh, sentences in Scotland's prisons, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm how many veterans have been diagnosed with PTSD? Cabinet Secretary. I don't have the figure uh, to hand, but I think it's a very important issue that Maurice Corey uh, raises, and I'll, I'll go back and I'll see if we have uh, the figure to hand. Clearly, a number of people uh, in our care and in, in, in custody uh, in Scotland present with mental health issues, a big part of the work uh, that veterans and custody support officers do is working uh, with mental health, uh, working on mental health uh, issues. So if I can go back, uh, if I can see if we can extract that information, I will provide it to Maurice Corey, uh, but I think it's an important issue that uh, he raises. Question five, Neil Finlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Justice Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding the impacts of reductions to Scottish Legal Aid Board funding on child poverty. Minister. The main legal aid fund is demand-led, and unlike the position in England and Wales, the wide scope of legal aid in Scotland has been maintained, including for civil and family cases. In addition to the main legal aid fund, the Scottish Legal Aid Board has managed over recent years, on behalf of the Scottish Government, a variety of specific, time-limited projects and funds to deliver access to justice and advice services, including for families. Decisions on the criteria and allocation of specific grant funding are taken within the context of our policy priorities, including our absolute commitment to reduce child poverty, as well as ensuring the most efficient use of resources and transitional arrangements to any new funding schemes. Neil Finlay. That commitment does sound a bit hollow because 230,000 Scottish children live in poverty and the number is rising, yet the government is cutting the funding to the Scottish Legal Aid Board, which provides that funding to the Citizens Advice Bureau to deliver their Making Advice Work programme, replacing it with a much smaller grant that Bureau will have to compete for. Why is the government doing this at a time when child poverty is rising? Well, in fairness, it's a question of the Legal Aid Board, but you should answer, if you wish, on CABs. Uh, the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan was published in March 2018 and sets out a cross-government action to contribute towards reductions in child poverty levels. And the plan covering the period of 2018 to 22 is backed by a multi-million pound package of investment, including a new 50 million tackling child poverty fund. In um, relation to the other part of uh, the member's question, the Scottish Government will continue to provide SLAB with 2.7 million pounds next year to fund 27 projects that are focused on helping vulnerable people with debt and legal issues. And um, the Scottish Legal Aid Board was always clear that these projects were for specific purposes, subject to annual review and not to be relied upon as core funding. And I also note that Labour's only budget proposal this year from Alec Rowley would have resulted in further reductions oh. to oh. the oh. justice budget. Oh. So oh. under Labour, it's very clear that the Scottish Legal Aid Board and the Citizens Advice Bureau, and by extension, the vulnerable families that he has spoken of today oh. would be worse off. Question six, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports people in island and remote areas in accessing legal assistance. Minister. An independent strategic review of legal aid was announced to Parliament on the 2nd of February 2017. The chair of the review, Martin Evans, reported back to Scottish ministers in February 2018. Within his report, the chair commented on the availability of legal assistance in rural areas and recommended that a new payment model which takes into account geographical difficulties be set up. And I'm pleased to say that the first meeting of this panel will be on the 15th of March, 2019. It'll be vital that key stakeholders work together to make this panel a success. And with this in mind, we are implementing a 3% increase in legal aid fees, 
which will come into effect on the 26th of April 2019. The work of the review panel will be longer term and some changes will require primary le legislation, but in the shorter term, we'll continue to ensure that individuals who are entitled to it will continue to receive access to justice. In the event that private criminal solicitors are unavailable, public defence solicitors directly employed by the Scottish Legal Aid Board are able to assist. And in some rural areas, and that would include the Highlands and Islands, civil legal aid offices are able to assist in some types of civil cases. And we also continue to allow private solicitors to access payments for travelling time to remote or rural areas of the country if that is required. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for her response. I have to say one constituent has been unable either to find a local agent in the islands or to find a solicitor on the mainland who is prepared to travel to her location uh, and was, as a result, uh, repeatedly uh, found herself um, where the, the solicitor cited uh, her location as the factor for that, leaving her to represent herself on a matter of family law. What can be done to ensure that people's prospects of representation uh, are not determined by where they live? Minister... Minister, briefly, please. I will. Um, without the details of the case, I'm sure the member would understand that it's not appropriate for me to comment on the specific circumstances. But I do recognise that there can be a range of factors that can impact on someone's ability to secure legal assistance. But I thank the member for raising this constituency case with me. And if he can forward me details, I will raise this directly with the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. As Alistair Allen has said, there is a very limited uh, restricted legal aid provision in the islands and most people seeking representation now have to look south. Despite what the Minister said, Slab's reluctance to fund travel means that clients often only meet their lawyers on the day of the court hearing. So can I ask the, the Minister uh, to look again to work with the panel to ensure that the provision of legal aid uh, can be island proof to ensure my constituents have access to the legal assistance that they need? Minister. Again, I thank the member for raising that issue. It is something that we are taking on board um, in the process of the review and um, with the process of the panel going forward. We want to ensure that we have a, a legal aid system that is fit for the future and um, represents you know, fair and um, equitable access to justice for people who live right across Scotland. But I will take note of what the, member, the issue the member has raised. Question seven, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress being made by the Health and Social Care in Prisons Programme Board. Cabinet Secretary. Healthcare in prisons is the responsibility. Healthcare in prisons is the responsibility of, of the NHS. Uh, my colleague, the Minister for Health, Sport and Wellbeing, wrote to the Health and Sport Committee on the 22nd of February uh, 2019 to update on the progress of the health and social care in prisons programme. Uh, developments include better integrated health and social care provision, improved clinical IT, and an innovation fund to improve joint working between NHS and SPS. For further information, the letter is available on the Health and, and, and Sport Committee's page uh, on the Parliament website. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Last year, it was revealed that more than 3,800 people who left prison between 2016 and 2018 identified to local authorities as homeless. Without a home, people with convictions struggle to register with GPs and continue with the vital health and social care progress that was started whilst in prison. Can the Cabinet Secretary detail the measures that the Scottish Government will take to ensure that people with convictions have a house to return to and can access vital GP services after release? Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Well, can I thank Mary Fee for that question? It is a hugely important issue that she raises, and I know she's had a long-standing issue uh, in these uh, issues. I've met with the Housing Minister on a regular occasion to talk about the shore standards, which we'll be, we'll be familiar with. It is the importance of through care. Uh, that is so, so important to ensure that pre-liberation and then, of course, post-liberation, uh, somebody coming out of prison has that access, not just to, to, to uh, housing and, and health, as she rightly says, but also, for example, to addiction services and so on. Uh, bearing in mind the, the need for brevity, as, as, as the President Officer said, I will write to Mary Fee uh, with more detail on some of what we're doing. Uh, but, of course, I'd be happy to meet with her to discuss in more detail also. Uh, Jenny Gilruud must be brief, please, to supplement. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a sensible way to reduce Scotland's prison population is by extending the presumption against short periods of imprisonment, putting greater emphasis on community sentences, something that was backed by 85% of respondents to the Government's consultation? Cabinet Secretary, a yes or no will do. Uh, yes, and I hope to get parliamentary support for that. I'll be bringing forward the or or order in Eastern. Hopefully we'll have that in place by summer. Uh, question 8, Joan McAlpine, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether Police Scotland and the Scottish Court Service record incidents according to the alleged perpetrator's birth sex or by self-declaration. 
Cabinet Secretary. With regard to victims, witnesses and suspects, Police Scotland and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service record incidents according to a person's self-identified uh, gender. The Police Scotland require no evidence or certification as proof of gender identity other than a person's self-declaration. Unless, and I think it's important to emphasise this, unless it is pertinent to any criminal investigation uh, with which they are linked and it is evidentially critical that Police Scotland legally require this proof. Jo McAlpin. I thank the Minister for that answer, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but I think many people will be shocked to hear it. The Minister will be aware that offending rates vary significantly according to biological sex, with males accounting for 84% of violent crime and more than 95% of sexual crime. Longitudinal studies elsewhere suggest male pattern offending remains the same even if men self-declare themselves to be women. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with criminologists that it would be misleading, it is misleading, if data shows a rise in female sex offending, for example, including rape, when these crimes are actually committed by men? Cabinet Secretary. Let me try to give some reassurance to the member if I can. And of course, I'd be happy to look at the, the longitudinal studies that she, she mentioned. I have to say, I meet with criminologists on a regular occasion and none of them uh, have raised this issue with me, but I'm happy to look at studies uh, if, they, if they exist. Uh, I should say, uh, if we should have an unexpected result, such as a rise in the number of women recorded as committing uh, sexual offences, we would, of course, investigate these statistics further. Uh, but I would say that statistic that she quotes, you know, the 96%, as I have it, uh, of, of uh, men who, who account for, for sexual crime, that statistic itself, I would say, is, is evidence that there's, there's certainly not a pattern of behaviour that we can see of those that are born biologically male self-identifying as women to either commit sexual offences or indeed manipulate statistics. In fact, uh, the stats that, 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 that quote, uh, as I say, bear some of that out. But if she would like to provide me with details of the studies, if she would uh, like to have conversations with criminologists, and indeed I do on a regular occasion, then of course I'm happy to explore that issue in further detail. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. I thank members on the front bench because we managed to get through all questions and supplementaries. We're now moving on to the next item of business.